This is an NBC5 News special presentation. The Vermont Lieutenant Governor debate, live from South Burlington. Thanks for joining us tonight for NBC5's first primetime debate ahead of the general election. I'm Brian Colloran. And I'm Alice Kang. In our studio tonight, we have the two candidates running to be Vermont's next lieutenant governor, Democrat and progressive David Zuckerman of Hinesburg. Mr. Zuckerman, a farmer, served as lieutenant governor from 2017 to 2021 after several terms in the State House and Senate. And Republican nominee and state senator Joe Benning of Linden. He has served six terms in the Senate, representing Caledonia County, including four years as minority leader and as an attorney. Welcome. Let's thank you quick, for having us. Well, thank you for being here tonight. Let's quickly go over tonight's rules. They are pretty simple. Each candidate will have one minute for opening statements. Then we're going to ask questions, giving both candidates a minute to answer, and we may offer a 30-second rebuttal. Then we'll have a round to ask direct questions to each candidate, followed by a lightning round and then the closing statements. So if we are ready, we'll start with opening statements. Mr. Benning? Thanks for having us. David, start off the right way. I'm Joe Benning. I'm running for Lieutenant Governor, and I hope that you'll give me serious consideration. I think you'll enjoy tonight's program because David and I have known each other for some time, and we think we can make this a very cordial event. I'm going to take a brief moment to divert from politics because I want to give a shout out to my campaign manager, Alex, and his wife, Marilyn, who unfortunately lost their beloved dog, Keely, last night. And I just want you guys to know we're thinking about you, and sometimes politics isn't everything. Back to the subject of why we're here tonight. I've spent 12 years in the Senate. I want to bring that stability and historical knowledge into the body as lieutenant governor. I want to help our governor, Phil Scott, as he tries to keep the affordability crisis under control. And I think we are still in the middle of an affordability crisis. And I hope as you go on this evening to listen to our comments that you pay special attention to the differences in how we would approach that affordability crisis. Mr. Zuckerman. Well, thank you for having us today, uh, Alice, Brian, Channel 5, and the folks watching. I'm glad you're tuning in. Uh, it's an important conversation that before us. As was stated, I'm a father, a farmer, small business person, and I have served you for 22 years in the House, Senate, and as Lieutenant Governor. What I'm hearing as I travel around the state are huge issues on people's minds. Housing, health care, cost of living, child care, the climate crisis, and I have to mention, uh, I'm sure many Vermonters are thinking about either friends or folks you know in Florida and what they're struggling with. We have that experience, of course, with Irene. It's, it's certainly a huge tragedy and I would argue related to the climate. And I want to bring my experience tackling major issues to the Lieutenant Governor's office again. I worked on marriage equality, worked on raising wages, and issues like housing and education. And I look forward to having a good discussion this evening with Joe and the folks here uh, in the studio to really bring forth the differences that we have and the experience I have of working with you, through you, to make good policy in the state house as I have for many years. Thank you. All right, let's begin that discussion. The role of Lieutenant Governor is pretty limited in the state of Vermont. You preside over the Senate five months of the year. You only vote to break a tie and you take over if tragedy strikes the governor. Besides that, what would you bring to the job that would distinguish you from Lieutenant Governors we've had before? Mr. Benning, let's start with you. Well, first, I'll have to say that I've gotten more experience in the Senate than the last two lieutenant governors combined. My intention with this particular position would be to get out there and promote Vermont in every way, shape, or form I can in order to help the governor keep us in the control of any affordability crisis that we're facing. We've had a lot of opportunity in this state with federal money that is now coming to an end. And I want to be able to be out there with the governor trying to protect everyone's ability to afford to live here and make this a great state to live, work, and play. I want to be out literally as a cheerleader, if you will, for Vermont, going around this nation and perhaps the world in order to bring attention to what we can offer here. It's a great place to live, work, and play. And I want to be able to use that role to pump Vermont as much as possible. Mr. Zuckerman. Well, thank you. Uh, as you know, I was lieutenant governor for four years, and I have a lot of experience working with Vermonters across the state in a way that I think 
uh, nobody else may have, maybe had done before. I held town meetings across the state. I had movie series where we talked about uh, important documentaries on issues of child care, raising wages, health care, toxics like PFAS. Brought that movie down to Bennington when we were addressing the water quality issues in Bennington. And that work, working with Vermonters all across the state to amplify your voices, to bring them into the state house, to encourage you and work with you to how to influence policy that's happening through your legislators, your House members, your senators. That's the work that I've done, much as an, ambas as an ambassador would do. I have a foot in the state house, and I would have a foot outside the state house, working with you on the important issues of today, the housing crisis, the, the wages, and getting those up to where people could afford food and shelter, child care. Those are the issues that I'm going to elevate with you across the state. Thank you. In Vermont, the governor and lieutenant governor campaign independently for their own two-year terms. And I'm wondering if you think that still makes sense. Would Vermonters be better served by having the two leaders working together around a common agenda? Mr. Benning? I obviously think so. I actually have known Phil Scott for about uh, 14 years now. We've campaigned together. We have been working on a daily basis whenever the legislature is in session. I've advanced many of his pieces of legislation through that body. The most classic recent example of which is the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. He had the idea that we needed to complete it. We got the money through in my capital bill in the Institutions Committee. And as you ride along Route 15 right now, you will notice there are many infrastructure projects that are taking place along that trail. We hope to have it up and running as a 93 mile long recreational facility in the state of Vermont, which would make us quite unique in the United States. So I happen to agree with that statement that the governor and the lieutenant governor should be able to work together. Mr. Zuckerman. Well, thank you. You know, uh, Vermonters want choice. In fact, Vermonters have shown time and time again that they've elected individuals based on how they feel about the individual, the different issues that people bring up, and sometimes actually really do like to have some of those different issues being addressed in different ways by the two top office holders of the state. I have worked across all three parties and with independents, both as a chair in the uh, House on Agriculture and as Lieutenant Governor, to make sure we can bring everybody to the table. We can show in Vermont something that really we haven't seen in other parts of the country uh, lately, which is the ability to work together. Joe and I have worked well together despite the fact that we sometimes have disagreed, uh, and I can work well with the governor on issues like affordable housing, uh, tackling the climate crisis, and so forth. Happy to work with him. I think it's important that Vermonters get the choice. Uh, this is one of the things that I think we cherish in Vermont, is that ability to look at each individually as opposed to uh, a team and a yes person who's just going to go along for the ride. Okay, we have a follow-up question. At the Digger debate last night, Governor Scott said he'd rather have a running mate as most other states do, so voters elect a ticket. Democratic challenger Brenda Siegel disagreed. Do you care to comment, Mr. Benning? I think it is important for the two top constitutional officers in this state to be able to coordinate with each other, to be in harmony and synchronization. We are about to face a substantial downturn in the federal government's revenue stream that's kept us afloat for the past two years. And I think at this critical time, as we come out of COVID, we really need to have two people at the top of the ticket who are working together and not opposing each other. I like Brenda Siegel. I've uh, had many opportunities to chat with her, but the bottom line is I believe Phil Scott will be reelected. And I believe between David and I, that I happen to fit the best uh, situation for working with the governor. Mr. Zuckerman? Well, I think if you look back at uh, the last four or five, maybe even six governors, uh, we've far more often than not had everyday Vermonters selecting folks with different parties. And yet, thankfully, and I think we can do it again, worked well together for the people of Vermont. I think the issues are more important than the politics or the party labels. Uh, I think we all recognize that health care and housing uh, are huge issues. The price of housing is going through the roof with both uh, climate migrants uh, coming to Vermont as well as rentals, long-term rentals being converted to short-term rentals. I think when you recognize the common struggles, you can then work and negotiate and figure out ways to, to work to find solutions to those problems. It's not so much having people of the same party as recognizing what these major issues are. We've got to take the climate crisis seriously. We have to take the housing crisis seriously. We have to take the, the child care crisis seriously. And I think issues are frankly more important 
uh, than some of the, the politics conversations that happen. Let's talk about an issue that Vermont has dealt with for a while now. The 2020 census showed that Vermont's population actually ex expanded over the past decade by about 2.8 percent to about 643,000 people. And we uh, grew a little bit more during the pandemic. But we have an aging state. We are having fewer kids than ever before. What new idea do you bring to the table to help grow our population? Or is this even really a problem? Uh, Mr. Zuckerman, let's start with you on this one. Well, I can tell you from my experience at the farmer's market all summer, meeting new people who have been coming to Vermont literally every week, asking folks, you know, do you live in the area? No, I moved here two weeks ago. I moved here three months ago. I moved here a year ago. Uh, we are seeing, due to our leadership on the climate, our leadership on COVID mitigation, both our communities as well as leadership in our governance, uh, that we have sound uh, minds and heads on our shoulders, unlike some of what's happening around the country. Some of the migrants have said, uh, I'm moving from Florida, I'm moving from Louisiana, I'm moving from Texas because it's too hot. I think we have set the table for people to move here. Now what we need to address is making sure we have the housing and make sure Vermont's still affordable for Vermonters who are born here as well. That means investing more in affordable housing, not just the COVID money, the 90 odd million dollars, but we have to be looking out two, four and six years and say, how do we then fund a continued building of affordable housing, whether that's a rooms tax on rentals, whether that's Airbnbs, whether it's actually splitting our grand list into three so that sec wealthy second homeowners can contribute more to our education system. Mr. Benning, do we have a population problem and how do we fix it? We do have a population problem and one of the things I'll agree with David on tonight is that I too on the campaign trail have met many folks who have recently come to Vermont. The problem I've noticed is that most of them are in their elder years. They have gotten out of places they were just tired of living in, and they don't represent that youth that we need to bring into this state. One of the things I'd like to do with this position is literally get out and promote our colleges, trying to bring young people to the state. We have many different facilities, this television station being one of those things that we can use to promote ourselves, as well as the people who are coming up through the ranks to take over these cameras, to take over the anchor spots. We have facilities around the state that provide wonderful education for this, and we really need to promote bringing young people here, and somebody in the lieutenant governor's office really ought to be around the country trying to get people to come here that are younger in age. Well, I still have two kids that go through college, so we can't replace me just yet. <laughs> Let's just make that clear. Da David, you have a Thanks, rebuttal yeah, there? Just briefly, uh, I will say the folks that I'm seeing at the farmer's market around the state are of all ages. A lot of young people are moving here because of the Dodd decision. Young people are moving here because we take the environment seriously. Uh, what we have to do is make sure there's a place for them to live. You know, a lot of older folks who might have the resources and can move because they're in retirement with enough resources to do so is a good thing. But we have to make sure there's affordable housing so they can welcome that young workforce and keep them here. We need childcare so that they can afford to be here as young families. And Mr. Benning? Yeah, I just want to point out, uh, David has not been in the legislature for the past two years, but we have spent a great deal of money, $90 million actually, in order to address the housing crisis in this state. Just yesterday, I was in St. Albans with the governor opening up a new building that's going to be uh, providing new housing for folks. We were in Rutland last week doing the same thing, and about a month ago he was doing the same thing. I believe it was uh, up in Franklin County. But the bottom line is we've devoted a whole lot of money over the past two years to trying to address that problem. Okay, continuing with the housing crisis, are Vermont lawmakers and the administration moving as fast as practical to expand housing options for low and moderate income people? Mr. Benning. I believe at the moment we are. We have a whole lot of money that's been devoted to this effort. We just don't have the shovel ready projects ready to go. And when you have a labor force that is missing from the construction companies that would normally be doing this, as well as a supply chain problem, you have delays in the system. So I don't think that the government necessarily is dragging its heels here because the government has in fact dedicated a substantial amount of money to get these projects going. We have a labor shortage and we have a supply chain problem that is actually delaying a lot of these projects. Mr. Zuckerman. Well, in some respects, I, I would agree that there is enough money in the pipeline right now. 
and we need to be moving those forward. But I think most Vermonters would say, despite some of the recent uh, housing options that are opening up around the state that were just mentioned, there is still a massive housing crisis. This is not at all resolved. And I, with the number of people moving here, as I mentioned earlier, I don't see that slowing down, which means not only do we need to make sure those $90 million are spent effectively, but we have to look at what does come next. You know, this has been an issue that's been built not only uh, in the recent scenario, but we've had a housing shortage and an affordability shortage for a while, and there were not major investments in housing for a number of years. There was an initial one by the governor, and I applaud him for that. But then it was sort of, we're done, we've put money in. I think one of the big differences here is someone who's going to look at the year in and year out investments that need to be made, not just one shot deals when you get free money from the federal government, but actually looking at how do we create perpetual funding for more affordable housing and not have Vermont just fall into being a playground for the rich. Let's talk about what's going on at the state house. This year, many, many state lawmakers decided against reelection because they simply couldn't afford to continue uh, as we know it, Vermont lawmakers earn about $14,600 a year. There, is n there are no health benefits. There is no retirement fund. Do you think we should raise pay for the legislature? What would you change? And is there a number that you have in mind? Mr. Benning, let's start with you. I believe the answer is no. The legislature was always meant to be a part-time legislature. You don't get rich being in the legislature, that's for sure. But the nutshell is, in order to increase the pay for those legislators, you have to increase taxes. This is no time to be doing that. I have to disagree a little bit with you, Brian, about why we're in the position we're in with the turnover in the legislature. Frankly, from what I saw, it was COVID-19 that was exhausting all of us. And going through that whole process of having to be on a TV screen, trying to do our best to do a work product that is respectable, that was very difficult for every legislator in the building. And I personally think that's the main reason why people are retiring. Mr. Zuckerman. Uh, there's no doubt uh, that the COVID pandemic and operating under those circumstances affected everybody in their workplaces, whether it was teachers, healthcare workers, just about everybody I know is exhausted from these last few years. And I think that is true. That's the same with the legislators who had to work remotely. And I was there during that first session when COVID hit and how late we went into June uh, to make sure as many measures were put in place for Vermonters' health and well-being and safety structures and neighbor structures to take care of Vermonters. All of those legislators deserve tremendous credit. You know, I think when you look at who has access to run and serve, there are a lot of people that cannot do so because of the pay relative to the time commitment. Yes, it's a part-time job, uh, sort of full-time from January to May, but there are many, many meetings year round that you're asked to go to and many legislators want to go to in your communities to find out and listen to your communities about what's happening. None of those are compensated for. And I do think for younger folks who want to get involved and middle-aged you know, folks with families who want to get involved, it is extraordinarily difficult to do so. Okay, so let me circle back. Uh, David, you say they deserve a pay raise. The, those state lawmakers, Raise the pay? Uh, that's a question. Yes, I do think they do. They do at this point. The world is more complex than when the legislature was first set up. OK, Mr. Benning, uh, the governor said last night that he was for a hike in the pay raise. So you differ with him on that. I do differ with him on that. And I believe that it is an honor and a privilege to serve in the legislature. It was never meant to be a full time position. Our constitution was set up to make sure that that never happened. So at this point, I can understand where David is going with it, but it essentially is a difference between the two of us because his plan is gonna force us to raise taxes, which is gonna have a direct impact on the affordability crisis that every one of us is facing. Mr. Zuckerman, you wanna re well, respond to if that? If I may, I know uh, my opponent has talked in other debates about eliminating certain taxes, um, which would also lead to cuts in services and programs. But the reality of a few hundred thousand dollars or even a million dollars on uh, pay for the 180 legislators to do their job for Vermonters uh, is not gonna lead to a raise in taxes. Uh, if it does, it's within a whole package of lots of other reasons. Uh, but the reality is if you want a wide range of Vermonters to be able to serve and you wanna see more perspectives in the legislature, you've gotta make it possible for people to do it while paying their bills. Okay, let's talk about the, the job that you both are running for. The current governor once held this position. The current lieutenant governor chose to move on after one term in office to seek federal office. 
Do you see this job as a stepping stone? Mr. Benning, let's start with you. I do not see it as a stepping stone. In fact, one of the reasons that got me interested in running was I saw it as a revolving door for politicians who were trying to advance their political career. The Senate as an institution needs some historical knowledge. It needs some stability as we're coming out of COVID-19. It needs to have people who are dedicated to the idea that frugality is gonna be the order of the day as we head into these next few months. And I wanna make sure that I'm there and available to try to bring all that together. I've also committed myself to running again should I be elected this year. Uh, because I really do believe that this institution needs some stability and I don't want to use it as a revolving door to another place on the hierarchy of politics. Mr. Zuckerman. Well, I'll say almost nobody that I know has made promises about what they're going to do two years from now. We certainly don't know what tragedies or opportunities will arise. We don't know how uh, positions will open, whether it's the governor's office or congressional offices. I'd be surprised if Phil Scott didn't run for office that my colleague here wouldn't be encouraged to run for governor as the then would be highest elected Republican in the state. Uh, as you know, I've run for governor two years ago. I didn't do that out of the lieutenant governor's office as a stepping stone. I did it because I thought there were issues that the governor had done vetoes of, minimum wage, climate, and others that were important in the day. Obviously, a few weeks later, uh, the world turned upside down with COVID. So the, the point is that there is no forecasting what will happen in two years. It's really up to Vermonters and the issues and what folks want to see in those next offices. My goal is to return to the office of lieutenant governor with the experience that I have, the knowledge I have of the Senate and of the issues and the connections to Vermonters to make sure your voices are heard at the table on those issues. Go ahead, Mr. Benning. If, if I turn the clock back a couple of months, David, I know that you were asked the question point blank down in Rutland during the primary debate there. And the question was, will you commit to not running for a higher office in 2024? And the distinct recollection I have is that you said you were not going to so commit. That troubles me because I really believe the institution needs to have that stability. I may be the highest ranking Republican in 2024, but I am standing here now telling you it is my absolute commitment to run again for this particular office to provide stability to the institution. I would just argue if you want stability, uh, then put someone back in the lieutenant governor's office who has that experience on day one, uh, both assigning committees, uh, providing uh, the town moderator perspective, uh, as I did for four years, and I think was well respected in that position across all, all folks in the building. I don't know if you'd feel that way, but I think so. Uh, and so if you want stability, let's start with it now in the midst of a housing crisis, a climate crisis, a childcare crisis, an affordability crisis, and a real struggle for Vermonters to get through their day. All right, let's talk, Mr. Benning. Sure. Um, David, you haven't been in the building for two years, so I have to say there has been a lot going on there while you've been gone. We have a lot of people turning over who have struggled through the Zoom environment that we have all been in. And at this point in time, I would have to say I have more stability and history with that body than you do overall. And even in the two terms that you were serving as Lieutenant Governor, the bottom line was we were working as legislators trying to make sure all of these things we're talking about now were covered. One of the biggest things was getting the public into the building in a way that they were not locked out. I wrote the rules for having all of that happen. When any of you viewers out there were getting into the State House via Zoom, those were rules that I was working on to make that all happen. And it was a lot of work. The people who were on the inside of that building spent a lot of time trying to struggle through that process. But I think we were very successful in bringing you back all of you back into that building. And if I might add, uh, the vast majority of those colleagues uh, have endorsed me to be Lieutenant Governor because they recognize the work that I had done with them both before uh, COVID and through the beginning of COVID as well. And I think uh, everybody deserves a lot of credit for a job well done, all the leadership over the last few years. And uh, they've encouraged me to be Lieutenant Governor.
All right, we've got about 35 minutes to go here. Let's, uh, we've got a lot of topics to hit. Let's hit the next one. All right, the next topic is opioid crisis. 217 people died in Vermont from drug overdoses last year. That's a 33% increase from the year before. The state's Department of Health says 210 of those, so about 95% were accidental or undetermined. So is the state doing enough and would you support opening safe injection sites? Mr. Zuckerman? I firmly support uh, harm reduction sites, safe injection sites. Uh, these are locations where folks who are going to be using one way or another uh, can come to a safer environment where if they have uh, a, a instance with fentanyl or too much, uh, there's someone there who can immediately administer health care. It's also an opportunity for those individuals to have access to supports and get access to opportunities, whether it's Jenna's Promise up in Johnson or other locations in Vermont where we're working on wraparound services to really help people break this struggle that has been caused by the pharmaceutical industry and by economic hardship, by our housing situation. The opioid crisis is an is a issue of many, many subject matters that all need to be addressed as a collective group. Uh, but yes, I do support it. It clearly will reduce the number of deaths. We've had the record number in this last two years, and I was very disappointed that the governor vetoed the bill and that my colleague here voted to sustain that veto. Mr. Benning. So I agree with David that it is a many-faceted problem that we are facing with the opioid crisis. After 40 years of being a criminal defense attorney, I can safely say that especially over the past 15 to 20 years, virtually every criminogenic aspect to our environment is subject in some way to the opioid crisis. Jenna's promise, as David and I have both now toured it, is a wonderful opportunity to bring wraparound services to people. But when you get back to the question, Alice, of whether or not we should have safe injection sites, the Judiciary Committee that I serve on took a lot of testimony on that subject. We did not come away feeling comfortable with the idea that this was the cure-all to anything. And the basic problem now is you would have to have it in a place where the most population is, meaning Burlington. And the crime rate in Burlington is getting out of control. This is an invitation to people to come and participate in consumption. That's not the direction we should be taking the state. If I might, it's not inviting people to participate in consumption. The consumption is happening. The question is, can we do it in a safer way and have more access to these individuals to make sure they can get the help they need to get out of this cycle sooner, get back on their feet, get back into the workforce. We have a workforce shortage. This could be related to that as well. Um, you know, what's, what's frustrating is the committee did vote not to have uh, safe injection sites, but voted to do a study. And the study got vetoed, and my colleague voted against that. So I would say studying this is at least the minimum we could do. Mr. Benning. So quick, quick wrap around, wraparound services do not get accomplished in an environment where the only thing you are doing in a safe injection site is to provide Narcan in the case of somebody's overdosing. We don't have the resources to bring ideas like Jenna's promise into a safe injection site. It just doesn't work, which is why I voted against it. All right, Vermont's 2022 gun reform law extended the waiting period to complete a background check from three to seven business days, and it bans firearms from hospitals. Was that enough? And as lieutenant governor, would you urge your colleagues to do more? Mr. Benning. I would not urge my colleagues to do more. I have a very firm adherence to the Vermont Constitution, and it's a very explicit statement that says, you have the right to bear arms for self-defense. If you place a burden in front of that, like a waiting period of any kind, you are essentially placing a burden in the path of your constitutional right. I would never require you journalists to wait 24 hours, for instance, before you published anything that you wrote. I would never encourage legislation that required a woman to wait 48 hours to exercise her right to privacy by getting an abortion. I am a firm believer in the Vermont Constitution, and as long as that document says what it does, I intend to do what I can to try to uphold it. If you don't like the Constitution, it can be changed, but until that happens, I am sworn to uphold and defend it, and that's what I would intend to do going forward. Mr. Zuckerman. 
Well, first of all, we've already uh, taken some steps. So if they were constitutionally uh, across the bound, then they would have been thrown out by the courts. So the idea of uh, extending it from seven days to 30 days, which was the original uh, idea, in order to make sure there was the background checks done to, so that guns would not get into the hands of prior convicted felons of, of severe crimes and so forth, uh, I would support that. Of course, I would also urge our federal delegation to try to get more money into the ATF and others who do those background checks and have the background check system so that it wouldn't take 30 days. But if you're, if you're worried about your safety, you go in tomorrow and you put in and you will get that weapon if you'd like it in 30 days, which in most instances would be fine. If you're looking to hunt, you know that 30 days in advance. I would add the fact that 88% of our gun deaths in Vermont are by suicide. I would look at whether or not we ought to have a one or two day waiting period before you could take that gun home. Because we know with many folks who commit suicide, it is a spur of the moment thing and a little bit of time could actually save that person's life. So these are small uh, adjustments. They are not going to infringe on your rights. Two years ago, state lawmakers voted to override the governor's veto of the Global Warming Solutions Act, which requires significant reductions in the state's greenhouse gas emissions. An annual progress report from the Energy Action Network shows that Vermont is not on track to meet its requirements set for 2030. Should it be up to Vermont to take the lead on this global issue? Let's start with Mr. Benning. I don't believe so. In fact, I think we are doing ourselves a terrible disservice by adopting the guilt of trying to shoulder climate change responsibilities on our shoulders, that is just not the direction I would prefer us to go. Vermont needs to use what limited resources it has to address climate change in the most intelligent and fiscally responsible way we can. We've talked about this earlier in debates. The bottom line is 640,000 people cannot take on climate change as our primary responsibility. In doing so, we will not be effective. The law that we have now that enables someone to simply come in and sue the state of Vermont if we don't meet those carbon emission reductions, to me is a disservice to all Vermonters. I would prefer that we use our resources more intelligently, recognize what our limitations are, and not put a guilt trip on the shoulders of all of our population as a result of not being able to meet those climate change carbon emission reduction standards. Mr. Zuckerman. Well, I'm terribly disappointed that this has not been taken more seriously by this administration. I'm glad the legislature moved forward with the clean heat standard, although unfortunately it was vetoed and was unable to come into law. If you look at energy prices, they're stable. You look at fossil fuel prices, they are going up and down through the roof and really help hurting struggling Vermonters pay their way. I just saw a message from someone at their first home heating bill was $700 to fill their tank. The reality is the climate crisis and the fluctuating prices of fossil fuel are gonna hit working Vermonters, struggling Vermonters the hardest. You look at these hurricanes, you look at Tropical Storm Irene, the severity of these storms, the long-term costs and the immediate costs are outrageous. You look at our maple sugaring season getting shorter, our ski season getting shorter. If we don't do what we can, we are burying our heads in the sand for our children and our grandchildren. This is not something we can just punt off. Vermont has led the way. We led the way on marriage equality and the country and the world followed. We can lead efficiently and frugally and effectively, save Vermonters money, create jobs and tackle the climate crisis. Mr. Benning, you want to There rebut? is only one way we are gonna meet the carbon reduction standards that have been set forth. And we all know what it is. It cost me $76 to fill up my gas tank to get here tonight. My last oil bill was $800. That's the source of the affordability crisis in this state. We have to be more respectful of our resources, enable ourselves to become resilient. That's where our limited resources should be applied, not dreaming that we can simply take the bull by the horns and lead the nation. It's just not capable of being done by Vermont. Quick rebuttal to that. Just really quickly, if we had invested in weatherization like we were supposed to for the last six or eight years, we would have weatherized tens of thousands of more homes and that heating oil would go a lot farther through the winter and folks would have saved more money. If we do prudent investments that save Vermonters money and help reduce our fossil fuel use, we get a two for one. This is about smart investments and it's what Vermonters do. We make smart, frugal investments 
to improve our future. Okay, we've done 34 and a half minutes at this point. Let's take a break. You're watching the Vermont Lieutenant Governor's debate here on NBC5, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Vermont Lieutenant Governor debate. Here are Alice Kang and Brian Colloran. Welcome back to the NBC5 primetime debate featuring candidates in the race to be Vermont's next Lieutenant Governor. All right, we're going to shift gears now to direct questions where we ask one candidate a specific question. We're going to start with Mr. Zuckerman and we're going to start with this. Uh, just last week, we got an email into our inbox from your campaign looking for a donation. In the email, you say this race is being watched nationally and that quote, our opponent is courting MAGA Republicans, even those who participated in the January 6th insurrection. Do you believe Mr. Benning is a supporter of the insurrection? No, I do not. Uh, however, I do know he posted a video on his Facebook page the day after the election saying that he has more in common with his opponent and their supporters uh, than he does with me. Now, we've talked about the importance of the climate crisis. Maybe we have different opinions on how to handle it. But I will say that with respect to our democracy, I have nothing in common with folks that organized buses to the Stop the Steal rally in Washington. And I have nothing in common with respect to their views on a number of other issues. Uh, but I think when we're talking about democracy, uh, it's critically important that we don't say, well, I could put that aside. I think we have to call that out at every opportunity. Uh, I really respect Senator Jeffords, for instance, who eventually said, the Republican Party has left me. Uh, and I'm, I don't understand why some of our current reasonable Republicans, I think Joe's a reasonable guy, uh, is still maintaining the party label and carrying the banner for a party that's been taken over by uh, a perspective that is full of lies uh, and really is divisive and destructive to our democracy. Mr. Benning, I'm gonna ask you real quickly, uh, are you courting MAGA Republicans and those who participated in the insurrection? Brian, I am doing my best to bring the Republican Party together and bring it back from the right edge. I have worked very hard throughout my career to be a moderate Republican. I'm disappointed to hear that David is actually sending out messages like that because he's read my op-ed opinions about January 6th and what has gone on in the Republican Party. So I know he's also sending out other pieces to folks saying the Republicans are trying to build their bench and we've got to stop them. Well, I'm the one he's talking about. And I've been doing my best to try to bring the party back into civil integrity and transparent conversations, especially with opponents like David. 
Mr. Benning, you're way behind your opponent in fundraising so far. At last check, Mr. Zuckerman has collected well over $238,000 in contributions. You had raised about $38,000. What should we read into that? Well, I think you should read into that the very problem we just talked about. The Republican Party has been very divided. It has been very difficult to try to get people re-coordinated. And remember that Vermont Republicans are a different breed from everyone else. A lot of the folks who are old-time Vermont Republicans have been very frustrated by what they've seen, and it's been difficult to raise money in those quarters. But I think in the next campaign report, you may see a little bit of a difference. Next right. question. M Mr. Zuckman. Well, just briefly, uh, I would also say it's not just money, it's numbers of donors. I have uh, legions, over a thousand small donors uh, that have also helped my campaign, and I think that's a testament to the work I've done with Vermonters all across the state. Thank the, you. the next question. Mr. Benning, go ahead, real, real quick. You know, when you've run four statewide elections in comparison to one, you should have a whole lot more donors on your list and be able to reach out to them after four years of running statewide. This is my first attempt. I'm doing the best I can under the circumstances, and I think we're in a good place. All right, well, let, that kind of leads to the next question. Mr. Zuckerman, when the pandemic hit and you were lieutenant governor, you said Governor Scott had shut you out of briefings and meetings over the state's response to COVID-19. Why should voters believe that after running against him in the last election in 2020, that your working relationship would be any better going around this time around? Well, for one, I think, you know, from the last result, he probably doesn't have to be afraid of me running to try and beat him in the future. Uh, and so there's actually an opportunity to work together. I think there are issues that we both agree on. Uh, I've brought the idea of our $2 billion human services uh, agency and our $1.5 billion education spending to look at where we could find efficiencies between those two. They work with a lot of the similar families that are struggling and have kids in the school systems. So why not reach out and work together on issues that can both save Vermonters money, be able to use that money to help more Vermonters, maybe even put some money into tackling the climate crisis or childcare. Uh, and so I think there are places that we can agree. Uh, as I said earlier, Joe and I sometimes disagree, but we can certainly work together, uh, as has been the case when I've worked with uh, Representative Lynn Dickinson on Lyme disease and other folks uh, in various parties across the spectrum. So on my hand, we'll be out ready to work with the governor uh, no matter which person wins the office. Mr. Benning, you've made it pretty clear that Mr. Zuckerman does not have a great relationship with Governor Scott, who you expect to be reelected. But many times we've had lieutenant governors and governors of different parties. So why is this a big deal now? Well, it's a big deal now because we're still facing the affordability crisis that Phil Scott was talking about 12 years ago. And now we are facing a drastic decrease in the amount of federal funding that has been in our revenue streams. This is a critical time for Vermont, and it is important for the two top constitutional officers to be able to work together. I challenge David, if he has run against the governor, that's obviously a sign that he is against the governor's policies. He has made, I think, the terrible mistake of announcing to his supporters on primary night that he intended to get back to Montpelier to ride right over that hump, meaning the governor himself. Alienating the governor and the people that work for him would be problematic for David going forward if he were to be required to take over that role because that group of people that has now supported Phil Scott through this $8.2 billion budget would be alienated right off the bat if David had to take that role. Well, what I was speaking to on election night was about vetoes. And there were a number of vetoes that were lost by one or two votes in an override. And I was speaking to supporters of all the Democratic candidates in the primary who I think would want to see a few more legislators to make sure there would be an opportunity to pass climate legislation, to pass harm reduction, to pass gun laws and safety, to pass issues around child care. So that was the conversation. And certainly uh, folks have disagreed uh, between the governor's and lieutenant governor's office many times and have also maintain decency and dignity in both offices and with each other, and I would do that. We're gonna take this time to turn again to questions where we pose them both to you and you'll have a chance to answer them. It uh, seems that every industry across the state, every employer is dealing with a staffing shortage. You can't go to a local business without there being a help wanted sign out front. Uh, what will it take to solve this problem? Mr. Zuckerman, let's start with you. Well, first of all, as a small business owner, I'm well aware we've been shorthanded uh, two people all season this year, and it's been a tremendous amount of work on my spouse and I, and I've had an amazing crew uh, pick up the pieces where they could. 
uh, just tonight when I get back to the farm. I'm going to be covering up some more crops for the cold at night. And I hope folks around the state have either done that already or maybe we'll jump out after this debate to cover your, your sensitive crops. Uh, the reality is without enough housing, we won't have the workforce. I know people who are leaving the state because they can't find housing and they want to be here. They are part of the workforce and they're going to be leaving uh, because they cannot afford to stay here. I met a couple at the Champlain Valley Fair who are both working class folks, no kids. They were in their apartment. The landlord sold it. The new landlord kicked them out and swapped the rent up from $1,600 a month to $3,000 a month. I think there are things we can do to say, wait a minute, is there price gouging going on? How can we invest more in affordable housing? But without housing, we're going to continue to have a workforce shortage. Mr. Betting, how do we uh, solve the staffing shortage issue that we're having right now? I think this is one of the golden opportunities for somebody in the lieutenant governor's position to be out there trying to make the connections with people who could bring good jobs here. We have, as I said earlier, already planned money for the housing projects that we need to have. But you can't get those done without the labor and the materials to build what we need to have. But you can, as Lieutenant Governor, go around the country and try to solicit those entities like Beta Technologies. Beta Technologies is a company now out of Burlington that's building electric aircraft. They announced, I believe today, that they are expanding to St. Albans. I would solicit Kyle Clark and his family, the CEO of Beta Technologies, to come to places like Caledonia. We have housing available in Caledonia. We have lots of structures that that entity would need, as well as the educational facilities they would need to train their employees. That was what I want to do as Lieutenant Governor. Vermont has among the highest percentage of residents with health insurance, but costs are likely to spike next year. Pandemic-related labor shortages are driving up wages, along with higher prices for prescription drugs. Can Vermont afford double-digit increases, and what do you think could help? Mr. Betting? No, we can't afford double-digit increases, and I was chatting with the CEO of uh, a hospital two nights ago who made the suggestion, why don't we have every system coding exactly the same way. It would be a small thing that Vermont could do and would actually save us a lot of money. It doesn't make sense to have different companies coding the services in different ways because it gets more expensive to process those claims. So that's one small thing that could be done. But also on top of that, this is really a national discussion. It's long overdue to have this discussed in Congress. And quite frankly, we tried a few years back to do a universal health care system in Vermont that failed miserably after losing over $200 million of taxpayer money. So let's put the conversation where we can actually accomplish something and make sure that we take advantage of any suggestions that CEOs at hospitals might have. Mr. Zuckerman. Well, no, Vermonters can't afford it. Uh, it's nearly 20% of our uh, GDP in Vermont is health care and health systems. Uh, it is incredibly expensive. My daughter broke her shoulder this summer. And when she went in to get care, they ordered some things that she actually then didn't get, and we still got a bill for it. So there's all kinds of issues that we're trying to resolve as a family with the uh, health care providers. And I think a lot of this comes down to the system of payments and insurance and back and forth. And as Joe said, the different companies. If we acted like a single company, as many do, we are actually the home of the captive insurance world in Vermont. Why we don't do a, a basically a universal healthcare system just like a business does with captive insurance self-insuring and saving money and getting rid of all the overhead costs, or not all, but many. Uh, I think we could have a much smoother system for Vermonters, better access and more preventative medicine to reduce our costs. Can, Mr. Benning, real quickly. I believe it was Yogi Berra who said deja vu all over again. We've been down this road before, and we lost a lot of money. And at the very last moment, Governor Shumlin pulled the plug because he knew it couldn't be sustained. I don't want to go down that road again. Well, and, and the plug he pulled was on a system that was actually going to be in concert with some other states, was going to be far more complex than it needed to be. Uh, there, there is a simpler way, and there are people in Vermont that know it and we can work to do that. All right, uh, can either of you name a spot in Vermont that drives you nuts when you're on the move and you lose your cell spot, a spot that uh, drives you crazy that doesn't have coverage? Mr. Zuckerman, let's start with you. 
Well, folks may be surprised to know that even right in South Burlington, there's a spot uh, right on Dorset Street, south of Swift Street near the golf course. Uh, I think it's called the National Golf Course or something like that. Uh, I regularly lose coverage there as well as on a stretch of my own uh, dirt road in Hinesburg. So uh, this is an issue all across the state, but uh, even in Chittenden County. Mr. Benning. Yeah, I, I'm happy for sure. you, David, that you actually have that small of an area where you lose <laughs> coverage. Because if you're riding from Montpelier back to Lindenville on my daily trip home, most of that ride is without cell phone coverage. That has to be corrected. We are working on it. We have tried to vote money to resolving that issue, but we're still a long way from where we need to be. Knowing what we know now was a 2020 push to defund police in some of our communities a mistake. Mr. Benning. Absolutely. We have been leaving an image with the police that has left me very concerned as a criminal defense attorney about the ability of our citizens to be safe. The push to defund the police, the push for eliminating qualified immunity. I am a defense attorney by trade. I cross-examine police officers on a regular basis. But I recognize the difference in a police force that has lost its focus, lost its reputation, and struggles to pull that back. Burlington is a classic example of a move to defund the police, and now the crime rate is obviously rising. I believe that law enforcement officers are good people. They do their very best under circumstances that are very trying. None of them know whether they will be going home after their shift. And it is a troubling thing for me to watch when we are presenting ourselves with this attitude that police are somehow bad. I'd like to support them. Mr. Zuckerman. Well, I think there's a combination of things that have to happen. We have to both support our police as law enforcement officers and look to really expand the conversation around public safety. I was just talking with the head of the police union today about issues around mental health and how much law enforcement is interdicting in situations where that's not what their training is for. And it's really not an issue that they should be spending their time on. At the same time, I've also talked with a person, uh, a white woman with a black partner who said she's afraid to call law enforcement just because of the fact that unconscious bias may come into play. If she calls and says something's happening, they may think, that her husband is the intruder just because of unconscious bias. So I think there's a combination of things that need to happen. We need to support our law enforcement and recognize that every single time they're called, they are putting themselves at risk. They're, they're putting their family at nervousness. And we have to make sure that all citizens feel like they can call law enforcement for their protection or call human services or other avenues and expand public safety so we address our issues, not always with law enforcement officers. Can I follow up with both of you? Um, you know, BPD is offering a retention uh, bonus, a signing bonus. Uh, VSP's got dozens of openings right now. Do we need to increase the pay for our law enforcement officers? Either one of you. I think you do have to take that into consideration. It extends into our mental health facilities. It extends into our correctional facilities. You may have heard that there's a plan now afoot to have corrections officers go to 12-hour shifts. That is all a sign that these labor forces are severely depleted and we do need to make more investments. That may indeed require a raise in taxes, but it is a necessary thing. Increase in pay for law enforcement, Mr. Zuckerman? Well, I think that would help, although the, the big issue is that this is an issue all across the country. You know, law enforcement is seeing the same uh, challenges in filling its positions as farmers, as uh, schools, as hospitals. You know, the problem is there's a workforce shortage. And I don't think we're just going to have to pick and choose which ones suddenly get the raises while everybody else is left behind. Uh, but it is an issue. And I just want to say that with respect to Burlington crime, crime is up all over the country. Uh, this is not because of uh, the policies of Burlington, but I do think we have to address crime no matter what. Let's move on to the lightning round. Uh, this is going to be uh, one sentence, one word answers. Uh, let's start with this one. Will you vote yes or no on Proposal 5, the Reproductive Liberty Amendment to the state constitution? Mr. Benning. Yes. Yes. Mr. Zuckerman. Okay, two yeses. Do you plan to be a customer at one of Vermont's new retail cannabis shops opening soon? Mr. Benning. I have no desire to consume cannabis, never have. I have supported legalization because I always thought it was applied, uh, the law enforcement efforts were applied in the wrong okay. direction. And Mr. Zuckerman. 
As a long advocate, it may be a surprise to hear that I really don't smoke uh, at this point. Life is too busy and there's too much going on. I certainly used to. I'm going to visit to see them, but I don't plan to buy any. All right. Are you ready to buy an electric vehicle, Mr. Zuckerman? I invested in solar panels for the farm, so at the moment, uh, I'm not buying an electric vehicle until we're going to replace one of our vehicles, but hopefully sooner than later. Mr. Mr. Benning. I certainly will at some point, but the infrastructure is not there to get me from Lindenville to Montpelier and back again in a way that's going to make that make sense. So I am at this point not ready to buy one, but I do believe that's the direction we're all going to end up going. Okay, Although plenty really, of legislators really... make that commute and they do recharge. Okay, really quick. If I wasn't running for office, I'd be... Mr. Mr. Benning. More... Go ahead, either one of you. Real Spending quick. more time with my family and uh, showing up the loose ends on the farm. Mr. Benning. Practicing my law practice, which is what I'm doing even today full time. All right, now it's time for closing statements. Each candidate will have one minute. Mr. Zuckerman, we'll start with you. Well, I really appreciate this evening. I think you have a clear choice in front of you, someone with uh, bold ideas and vision and a history of working with Vermonters to tackle critical and difficult issues. Whether they're housing, whether it's health care, child care, the climate crisis, we have a lot on our plates right now, and we have to have a leader in the lieutenant governor's office who's ready to help push that envelope because the issues are so big and so urgent today. I have a proven track record of doing that in my past, working with Vermonters, bringing you into the process so that your voices and these issues get amplified and addressed. I really look forward to uh, meeting more of you on the trail over the next month. I do ask for your vote to return me to the office of Lieutenant Governor where I can get started on day one with the experience of both being a legislator and being Lieutenant Governor, a small business owner and a family person to help build a better future for our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much. I hope you'll visit my website, Zuckerman4VT.com. If you have either questions or you are looking for information, just reach out. Thank you. Mr. Benning. So viewers, I want you to pay very close attention to everything you've heard tonight because virtually everything that David has been talking about is gonna require an increase in taxes in one form or another. And to me, that adds to the affordability crisis. I think Governor Scott is a person who has kept on us on a level playing field over these past few years. I want to work with him as best I possibly can to keep that going. And there is one critical difference between David and I, and that is our respective relationships with Phil Scott. I have worked with him for 12 plus years, campaigned with him, driven legislation of his through the body, and I believe I have a great working relationship with him today, which is why he has endorsed me in this candidacy. David's had a rough ride with that relationship situation, and I believe you would end up with either conflict between the two top constitutional offices, or in my case, harmony. So I would appreciate your vote. You can find a lot more about me by going to joebenning.com, pretty simple. But I want to wish every Vermonter a great night and thanks for coming to watch us out tonight. And thank the both of you for coming here to South Burlington tonight. And thank you at home. Ballots are already arriving at homes across the state. The general election is Tuesday, November 8th. For the latest updates and information ahead of the election, you can visit our website, mynbc5.com. For Alice Kang, I'm Brian Colloran. Have a good night.